broadcasting from Studio 202 at the Springit Technology Center in Navasota, Texas. It's NOV Live. Now, here's your host, Michael Gaines. And hello and welcome to NOV Live. I am Michael Gaines and glad you are joining us today. We are excited to have you as we jump into our conversation today uh, in just a few moments where we are talking about floating offshore wind, a topic that has uh, been in uh, constant development over the last several years and certainly a topic that uh, we are excited to, to talk about and bringing in uh, some of the experts to give uh, their insight and analysis for you, as well as answer your questions. One of the things that we are always excited to be able to do here. So thanks for joining us today. And uh, so before we get into our conversation and bring in our guest, I want to go ahead and bring in Shelby Dumain to talk about how you can be a part of today's convo in addition to our Rig Geek post of the week segment. So Shelby, good to see you today. It's good to see you too, Michael. And, and thank you everybody for joining. If you're watching uh, on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, wherever in the world you're tuning in from, uh, we, we're happy to have your um, participation in today's show. And the best way you can do that is by commenting. Like I said, whether you're on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, you can comment below. And as you can see, I got my screens up here so I can see all comments. And we invite you to ask any questions you have uh, for our guest today while we're talking about um, a, a floating wind and our topic. So if you have any of those questions, go ahead and put those in. We love to see them. And we, we want to get as many answered live on air as we can at the end of the show. You don't have to wait to the end of the show to get your questions in, though. As soon as you think of it, go ahead and comment, and I'll be compiling a list. And like I said, we're going to do as many as we can uh, before we close out the show there at the end. And uh, I also, I always love to mention, if you ever want to watch any past episodes of either NOV Live or our other show, Inside Out, you can do so by going to nov.com slash Live. We'll have that URL on the screen. That's nov.com slash live. That's where we have all past episodes of the show. Uh, you can go there, check those out. And if you have any questions on any of those past shows, we want to make sure that we get those answered as well. And the way to do that is you can email any of questions for past episodes. You can email to social media at nov. Dot com. Uh, we still want to connect you with our experts. We don't want to let them any of those questions slip away. So go ahead and send us those there, and we're going to get your question answered. Uh, but again, just uh, for today, if you have any questions, just go ahead and comment. And like I said, we're going to get to as many as we can while we're live. Uh, those are all of the different ways that that you can ask your questions. Um, but now it's it's time for for where I ask you a question. And this week it's a little different. It's more of a a wind geek maybe or an energy geek. Uh, but it's now time for the rig geek post of the week. Rig geeks post of the week. I do want to preface it. Like I said, this is more for our wind geeks out there or general energy enthusiasts. Um, but you may know that, uh, you know, we're all used to seeing those fixed offshore wind turbines. You see them all the time. Um, but as, you know, we're going further offshore, we're going deeper and deeper waters, uh, we're starting to see a lot more floating wind turbines. Or, um, and, and so as, as they're emerging more, we're asking you today to put on your, your future goggles or, or try to look into the to down the line in the future here and approximately and we're going to have this question on screen approximately what year is floating offshore wind expected to exceed a uh, fixed offshore wind capacity so like i said if you think you can see into the future uh go ahead and let us know approximately what year you think we're going to see floating uh exceed fixed wind capacity offshore all right. Thanks, Shelby. Man, mm -hmm. future goggles. I'll, yeah. I'll take Normally I have a crystal ball, but you have future <laughs> goggles. So I'll, I'll take future goggles <laughs> any day. Right. I look forward to seeing a pair. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. good. Thanks, Shelby. All right. So uh, as, as Shelby mentioned, and as we talked about at the top of the show, we are talking about floating offshore wind. And to give us expert insight and perspectives, we have our guest today. Uh, we have Barand Yenya, who is the sales manager uh, at Gusto MSC. So, uh, Baran, thank you for joining us today. 
Yeah, good morning, Michael. Thanks uh, for being there. Yes, yeah, glad, glad to yeah. have you. So for those who uh, are always interested, we always get at least one person that says, hey, you know, where, where is your guest joining you from? So where, where are you joining us from today? I'm joining you from the Netherlands, Alsmeer, close to Schiphol Airport, uh, where I'm living. So this is, uh, this is the location of today. All right, perfect. Our offices are based in Schiedam, close okay. to Rotterdam. So uh, yeah, maybe we'll start with some some basics for for our viewers. Again, we never like to assume that everyone knows everything. So for those that may not uh, know, and, and it's somewhat to Shelby's question, I think folks are are familiar with seeing fixed offshore wind turbines. But when we're talking about floating offshore wind, it's like okay. So help me understand why why is this. Um, an an application and and what is what is the job that that we're trying to do with the floating aspect here? Yeah, indeed, floating wind today is uh, part of the energy mix uh, when it comes to the renewable side. So next to fixed offshore wind uh, and, and basically onshore wind and and solar, um, floating wind is entering this business. Why is it this entering the business? We see at uh, quite a number of locations that not everywhere there is uh, sufficient space for either solar or for onshore wind. Um, and not all countries have access to shallow waters. So just like uh, Japan region, uh, west coast of, uh, of US, there you have quite quite easy, very deep waters uh, within uh, limited space from, uh, from, the, uh, from the country itself, from, from the beach side. Uh, you end up in uh, water depths uh, over three, 400 meters, um, so fixed, Fixed offshore wind there is not, not possible. So as an alternative, uh, floating wind is uh, introduced and uh, we are looking at uh, big structures, floating structures that, uh, that need to be uh, well positioned when it comes to environmental conditions, seabed conditions, and obviously the uh, size of the turbines on top of them. But it's a, it's a big steel or concrete structure supporting uh, the bigger turbines out there. Mm. And the turbines themselves, they, uh, they are similar to the fixed offshore wind turbines. Uh, the uh, necessity there is to, uh, to do some extra control, turbine control, uh, ensuring that you uh, are uh, as high as with your efficiency as possible. So there's a main difference there, but that's, that's not in the structural side of, uh, of the turbine. Right. So, so Basically, it, it's an enabler for all those countries that do not have access to shallow water uh, and have uh, deeper waters available. Right, right. Yeah. And so that that makes sense uh, in terms of, of that component. Uh, looking at the uh, some of the, the major uh, operators, I know that if, if you're in, anyone who is who's been listening to any of the, the, the latest reports and and news you would have known that some of the operators, like as an example, you know, you had Shell, BP, Total, have all talked about uh, really getting, uh, making uh, intentional moves into the uh, floating uh, offshore wind uh, space. Can you can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the observations and and reasonings behind behind those moves? Yeah. Well, all the, the oil and gas majors are driven today with the energy transition. So they, they need to look into alternatives to the oil and gas sector. And it's uh, I cannot talk directly for the oil and gas majors, but what I sense is that the technology offered by uh, floating wind is a technology they can grasp. Uh, they understand semi-submersible. They understand the offshore uh, offshore conditions. The traditional fixed offshore wind is more or less dominated by a number of European traditional energy companies. And, and floating wind is giving an opportunity to the oil and gas majors to step in um, big time. Uh, they're looking at very big projects and, and you will end up with uh, consolidation where you will see uh, the bigger uh, companies uh, teaming up with each other for the bigger sites because of big, big investments there are expected. So. It's a technology they can grasp. It's a, it's a new technology. It's a low barrier to entry for them. So an alternative to fixed offshore wind, why not? So it's it's there for them. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, when you're looking at the capabilities uh, that that NOV has and the the team within when Gusto MSC 
uh, is able to bring to this space. What what is that, and and how how is that able to to provide uh, the the needed solutions that that customers and and um, you know those in the operator space are, are looking for? Uh, at uh, at Customer MSC, we were able to combine all our efforts on the oil and gas sector together with the offshore uh, offshore wind uh, sector. So we are designing jackups for the fixed offshore wind uh, market, and and with that expertise, understanding the turbines. Uh, together with our semi-submersible technology, we could combine those uh, those capabilities and, and really look uh, closely to uh, to floating offshore wind. So that, that's what we did. And within the NOV organization, we know that there are quite a number of uh, NOV companies out there that have oil and gas technologies, which we easily can, uh, can use for the floating wind industry as well. Look at companies like NOV uh, APL, they are very, uh, very big when it comes to complex mooring systems. While the floating structures you see, they need to be moored. So for us, it's very obvious to uh, to make use of the expertise of NOV APL and, and use their uh, mooring system designs. Uh, it's complex, uh, so it's something they really can do. Uh, on the equipment side, uh, they have an addition of NOV BLM. And we see that on the structure side, so with the fabrication of uh, the foundation itself, we can uh, add with uh, our companies like the fiberglass solutions, uh, where we deliver uh, alternatives to the steel structures, but uh, composite uh, stairways, uh, landing platforms, uh, ladders, piping, all that we can do from uh, in-house NOV. So there's quite some contribution that we can uh, put on the floor. And there's even a wider spread when you look at the bigger picture of floating wind, uh, cable laying, we have expertise where we can contribute. Um, flexibles, uh, flexible lines, connectors, dynamic uh, cable connectors, all that we, we do in oil and gas. And this we can turn over and, and look at uh, offshore wind. Right, right. A lot, so there's a, a big expertise. Yeah, logical, a logical move to combine and, and uh, in some, some instances directly apply and others repurpose those learnings and, and expertise, like you said, uh, to to this application. Yeah. So the, the business model that we're following uh, from an NOV perspective is that, that we will uh, supply design and mooring um, with a fabricator and an installation company. We can deliver the full floating foundation at an EPC, EPCI level, uh, being responsible for delivery uh, of the floater to the customer. And the customer will uh, obviously buy the turbine, put the turbine uh, on top of uh, the structure, and it's being towed out by an installation company to do a final installation. So it it, it is quite uh, quite big projects we're looking at. We're looking at about 50 units uh, at least for uh, for a project. Uh, so that's 50 times uh, at least three mooring lines, uh, 50 different floaters to be constructed. Mm. So uh, equipment wise, it's uh, it's it's big business for uh, for the market. So if you're just joining us this uh, in this episode of our our program, we are talking with Baran Yenya, who is a sales manager with Gusto MSC, and we are talking about floating offshore wind. So if you have any questions about uh, floating offshore wind technology or the market or any of any other questions that uh, you might have for this really emerging and innovative space, feel free to uh, put your question in the comment section, whether you're watching us on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. And we will try to get to your question uh, later in our program. So feel feel free. Uh, we, we have the uh, borrowed ear of, of Baron, so he is ready and uh, we'll be ready to take your questions in just a few moments. So, uh, Baron, I'm. I always find uh, you know the, the origin stories to be quite quite interesting, especially when you're talking about such uh, you know massive and and really uh, groundbreaking adaptation of technologies in in the energy space. So uh, even in the 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 wind energy space, I think it's it's still fascinating. So, could you share a little bit of background on where? Uh, floating offshore wind, uh, when, when, how and when that, that came to be? 
Yeah, good question. Um, from a customer MSC perspective, we were approached by the Dutch government to look into alternatives to uh, fixed uh, fixed installations uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, all the way back in 2002-2003. That's when we uh, published our first uh, trifloater, a fully braced uh, version. Um, at that time, we saw that the, uh, from an economical perspective, uh, it was not, not doable. Uh, floating wind was, was way out compared with the solutions brought by, uh, by fixed installations, monopiles and, and jackets. And in 2007, we saw Equinor stepping in with, uh, with a high wind spar. And not shortly after, followed by principal power with a semi-submersible uh, unit. So that those were the two first demonstration projects. Um, today, the market itself is, uh, is a little bit beyond demonstration phase. Uh, there have been a number of uh, demonstration models out there. Uh, market is looking at, uh, at small projects, pilot projects, ranging from three to, uh, to 10 units. That is today uh, in the pipeline. The first big project out there is uh, Skin Cardine, together with uh, the Equinor Highwind Scotland project where five and uh, six units have been uh, installed. Um, that, that's the range today. Uh, but it looks like that all the, uh, the companies uh, entering this market space are looking for, uh, for demonstration units or bigger projects. And we note that since last year, late last year, that one after the other bigger project is being announced um, due to uh, new upcoming projects, uh, Scott Wind Round, Brittany round in France, um, we see the electrification of the North Sea, uh, where platforms need to be electrified, uh, where floating wind is a solution. So more and more projects are out there today, uh, not being realized uh, as, say, first big orders for uh, fabrication companies. But uh, it looks like that the real host of the, this market is starting uh, either by the end of this year, early next year, when the first few big projects are announced uh, from an FID perspective. Mm. So that's what we're all waiting yeah. for. We also know that supply chain there will be a challenge because you are looking at steel production of, uh, of a, a big vessel. Um, and if you are ordering 20 vessels at the same time, you will occupy a shipyard in full for the next couple of years mm -hmm. to produce these units. So it is... Uh, <laughs> it's a nice market, and and it is starting. Mm -hmm. uh, all the big uh, the big companies out there, all the oil and gas majors out there, are announcing bigger and bigger projects. Mm. So I know that one of the the things that uh, customers mention, uh, almost regardless of of where you are in the uh, the space, is that yes, half the battle is providing the equipment, but the other part that that arguably could be even larger is the the support side or the aftermarket support side so uh talk a little bit about that because yeah to your point i mean these are um these are investments that that customers are making this is a a big undertaking and so certainly can provide the the upfront support and the the technology but again the the aftermarket is is just as as key um how, how do you how do we talk through that and and uh and support customers in that regard yeah, well, looking at uh, the aftermarket, indeed, it is uh, as important as, uh, as the CAPEX side. So OPEX is as important as CAPEX. From an uh, NOV perspective, we have uh, quite a base of, of service engineers. And within NOV, we're looking at an energy transition uh, as well. So it, it gives us, as a company, opportunities to step into this, making use of uh, the, the basis that we have. Uh, this is already what we're promoting out in, uh, in Scotland. Uh, with the Scott Wind Round, uh, that we will make use of, uh, of the service engineers that we have out there based. But that's the personal side. Um, on the other side, um, it is a new market. Uh, everybody needs to, uh, to look at, at maintenance schemes. How often does it need to be maintained, uh, preventive maintenance, uh, accidental maintenance? Uh, looking at that from, uh, from NOV, we have a uh, condition-based monitoring uh, system. We're looking at uh, the MAX platform, where we can uh, contribute with uh, all instrumentation uh, at, at both the structure, turbine, and the mooring system. We get that information. 
uh, gather it and, and combine it in the cloud, send it to the cloud, and with the cloud we can take out all the information necessary uh, looking at the integrity of, uh, of the systems mm. and the performance of the system. So with that, we can control the, uh, the OPEC side. Um, we do acknowledge that for floating wind, uh, there is still a discussion on uh, a tow back to port principle. If you need to do heavy maintenance on a turbine, that you bring it back to port. Uh, that's not, not always a logical uh, move. Um, but today it's very difficult at these heights. Uh, we're talking uh, over 170 meters hub height, 170 meters hub height, to exchange a, uh, well, nacelle would not be changed more likely, but if you need to exchange a, a blade, you are talking in the range from 50 to 100 tons at a certain height. Mm. Um, that today from a floating to floating position is a very difficult uh, activity. Uh, we expect that uh, from an NOV perspective, we can add there uh, with developments we're doing today, uh, blade runners or blade tools to exchange um, as being handled by the marine and construction side of, uh, of NOV. But we are aware that uh, new developed technologies need to be uh, put in this industry uh, to make maintenance easier than it is today. Mm. Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds like a whole uh, future series that that we might uh, dive into one day. But yeah, certainly know that yeah. you and the team are are working uh, working diligently in that space. So that's that's really helpful. Yeah. Uh, last question before we pivot over to to Shelby to get some of the the questions. I know I see that they are uh, coming in. So with uh, offshore uh, floating wind, uh, it's my understanding that there is uh, an association with the uh, high, uh, uh, excuse me, the capabilities with hydrogen. So yep. how? So yeah, and very candidly, I mean, I, I was provided this question, but I, I'm not even really totally up to speed on uh, what what those those synergies are. What what is that? Can you expound a little bit? Yeah. Well. If you look at uh, electricity production uh, on sea, uh, especially when it comes to deeper water and far offshore, um, you may note that, uh, that there's plenty of wind out there. Um, difficulty with uh, electricity is bringing it to shore. Uh, if you are far offshore, just say for argument's sake, you're somewhere in the Pacific and you've got a thousand kilometers to bridge before you come to shore, that's, that's way out, but there's a lot of wind there. And you will see combinations, uh, not even uh, Pacific, but we're already talking about uh, in Europe, so smaller range, that floating wind is combined with the production of hydrogen. Um, new new projects are uh, are popping up, where hydrogen uh, is uh, is made rather than than a direct uh, shore connection with the electricity. So you produce uh, at a local base hydrogen, that hydrogen uh, either transform it to ammonia uh, and use that as fuel, or you uh, bring the hydrogen mm -hmm. to shore. And at, uh, at a shore base, you make out of the hydrogen, you make electricity again. Mm. Wow, yeah, I mean, and, and, it, and as, as always, it's one of those, uh, what is it, uh, kind of the, the innovation is in plain sight. Like I mean, it makes sense to be able to utilize the existing uh, the existing assets and infrastructure for for the that duality. So yeah, no, that's 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 quite that's quite innovative. There, there's another uh, say purpose for that. If you look at the electrification of, uh, of North Sea, um, if you would provide electricity to a platform uh, with wind, and, and suddenly your wind is down. You don't have any wind and mm -hmm. you don't have any battery storage. So the the uh, the use of the electricity at the platform is, is, is not always equal to the electricity produced by the by the wind turbine. So there uh, hydrogen can interfere and, and be used as a buffer mm -hmm. to uh, to produce hydrogen. At the moment, you have an excess of electricity. And when there's uh, there's no electricity available, you use the hydrogen to fire up the uh, the platform. Mm. So it's a uh, it's a win-win situation. Uh, hydrogen is uh, is easily accepted as as fuel, or used as uh, as fuel. So right, right. Well, I know that uh, we we've got the questions piling up, so I'm not going to to delay too much longer. Before I do, hand it over to Shelby. 
uh, for those that, that uh, like to allow their fingers to do the walking for them, uh, where can they go to uh, read up and, and find more information on uh, floating offshore wind from, from NOV and the Gusto MSC team? Um, we are currently uh, available uh, at the NOV website. Uh, you can uh, go to the Gusto MSC website or you can send me an email and uh, I can get you up to speed. Okay, perfect. And uh, I think, so I always lean on Shelby for those those websites. So Shelby, where, where can folks uh, go? Do we have that e or that web address? I think that's mm -hmm. uh, nov.com slash offshore, offshore wind. wind. There mm -hmm. it is. You threw me a lifeline. All right, <laughs> nov.com slash offshore wind, or we can uh, put Barron's uh, email on the screen, uh, barron.yenya at nov.com. And uh, you can fire away your question if, if we don't get to it. But Speaking of questions, I know Shelby, you've you've had them queued up and ready ready to go. Oh yeah, and, and this might uh, be one of the shows we, we we get these every so often where we have almost too many questions to answer. In <laughs> you can the never time. have too many questions. Right. I don't consider it too many, <laughs> but I wanted to make sure that our audience knows if you don't hear your question asked on air today, we'll make sure we have someone in the comments uh, to get back to you. So so don't don't give up. But we're gonna try to get to as many as we can. So the first question I wanted to ask you is. Um, what comparative advantages do we have with this design compared to other market concepts? Yeah, there are today a lot of different concepts out there. Uh, what, what distinguishes is uh, the use of uh, limited water depth uh, at port side. So we have a design where we can uh, enter uh, the, the call it, uh, ports with a, a minimal water depth. Uh, we are looking at water depths uh, between 8 to 10 meters for our structure, where competition is, uh, is at deeper waters. Um, the structure we look at uh, as well as benefit is, is the positioning of the turbine. Uh, pretty advantages located uh, when it comes to installation of, uh, of turbine. Um, the total overall steel weight predicted, uh, we see uh, quite a number of uh, structures out there, uh, more heavyweight than, than our structure. So there, there are quite a number of uh, advantages to, uh, to this. And main focus uh, in the design, uh, you've seen a flat plated design, is that we are looking at uh, the use of, of the current shipbuilding industry with uh, flat panel welding streets to optimize uh, and, and automate the, the production of these units. Supply chain uh, and, and production speed will be an issue when it comes to floating wind, and we try to make this as easy as possible. So simple blocks, uh, modular blocks, the columns are all the same, um, making use of existing industry from the tubular side. So there uh, we, we are different, as we can call it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I know you were talking about maintenance earlier, and I think some people might, they might hear maintenance and then kind of associate that with, with cost sometimes. So what was cost with uh, wind kind of taken into consideration when uh, designing this? Yeah, it's a, it's a steel structure. Um, we try to minimize the amount of, of moving parts on board. So it's, it's a steel structure. Uh, there are no pumps on board. There is no machinery on board other than a small supply crane. Uh, we obviously have the mooring connectors and the mooring lines that, uh, that require some checkups and inspection works. Um, we make use of fiberglass, uh, limiting uh, corrosion. So we try to minimize as, as much as possible already in the design uh, the, uh, the amount of maintenance to be done. Excellent. And this next question comes from William on LinkedIn. And um, he asked, uh, you know, how will NOV adapt to offshore wind regions being more varied and dispersed as opposed to the traditional oil and gas hotspots? Um, and the fact that these new regions have maybe little or, or no uh, historical oil and gas infrastructure. In respect of floating wind, we are indeed looking at, at new locations. But these locations are more or less selected by uh, by the developers. That's not, not up to us. So the, the oil and gas infrastructure is, is not a necessity for us, if, if that answers the question. Mm -hmm. 
I think it does. Um, and if not, uh, William, if you want to let us know, and we can, like I said, we can get you back in the in the comments. Um, and this one comes from uh, Mahala on LinkedIn, and uh, they're wondering what is the expected life cycle of offshore floating wind turbines. The designs currently being made for the turbines, uh, we, we need to talk to uh, the turbine OEMs like General Electric, Siemens and Vestas. Um, but likely it's it's either 25 up to 30 years. That's also the request we get uh, from uh, the developers to design floating foundations for 25, 30, 35 years. Mm -hmm. And I, I gotta say, I saw this question, and, and I think I went, "Ooh, I want to know that." Um, which I, I I do with most questions, but this one really stood out to me uh, from Erwan on LinkedIn, and he was uh, wanting to know a little bit more if you could talk about uh, cloud maintenance for offshore turbines. Well, cloud maintenance um, at at NOV, we provide uh, the instrumentation and we provide the industrial computers to. Uh, send all data that's generated uh, at, at the structure and the turbine, depending on, on uh, the developer and uh, the involvement of uh, the turbine manufacturer here. But we can send all data to the cloud uh, via satellite. Um, we, pick, we pick up the data and in the service, we can digest this information with uh, custom made applications and you can think of anything, uh, but the application is, is again, it's a custom made. We can check on every signal, every output level, uh, every integrity level, production uh, numbers. Uh, we can check it, and, and with that, we can do the maintenance via the cloud. So it's a condition-based monitoring system uh, or remote monitoring system. Mm -hmm. It's as easy as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. And, and we'll wrap up with this one question. Like I said, if you didn't hear your question, we'll go back in the comments and, and answer um, any of those we didn't get to. Uh, but I want to ask, you know, so this is a, a, a new industry. So what are we doing to ensure that we're meet, meeting uh, local content requirements? Yeah. So when it comes to uh, to these type of projects, they are uh, dictated by uh, by governments. Governments will invest in uh, in floating wind together, obviously with the developers. Uh, all different kind of setups have been made, so we are bound to uh, to do construction of equipment or fabrication of the units at the location uh, where the the wind farm is uh, is to be placed. Um, we are talking to all uh, regional and global uh, steel manufacturers, installation uh, companies. And for every project, we reach out to proper uh, fabrication sites to do at least local assembly and, and to possibly look at local uh, local fabrication as well. And ma majority of the countries have access to shipbuilding uh, facilities or old shipbuilding facilities. And these are typical uh, facilities that you can use to build floating wind. Um, we recognize that investment needs to be made uh, in this world, but we see that uh, well, quite a number of governments are pushing to make this uh, this industry happen. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you uh, answering the, our audience questions. You know, audience out there, you never disappoint me with the, with the great questions you submit. And so before I, I hand it back over to Michael, I did want to uh, get to that rig geek or this week kind of a wind geek answer uh, so i'll ask that question one more time and again i saw some some great uh answers in there so if you think you might know it if you have fast fingers you can type it real quick and, and get that in there before we reveal it uh, but we were talking about kind of the capacity um offshore in regards to fixed wind versus floating wind and specifically we asked approximately what year is floating offshore wind expected to exceed fixed offshore wind um, I saw some really good guesses in there for 2030, uh, 2025, but uh, uh, like I said, whether you're looking in <laughs> future goggles or a crystal ball, uh, uh, the year that it's fixed, or sorry, floating is expected to exceed fixed offshore wind capacity is around 2040 to 2050. Mm. Um, so I appreciate all of you uh, this week, like I said, wind geeks answering those questions. And and uh, um, yesterday I know was was wind day, so. 
happy wind day to our, our wind geeks. And thank you for participating in the conversation today. And with that, I'll, mm. I'll throw it back to you, Michael. I mean, you, you, you said 2050 and I'm, I'm, I'm doing some uh, counting on my fingers thinking that's about 30, 30 years or so from now. Uh, and I'm thinking, okay, 30 years. Well, that's, that's just the 1990s. So, uh, you know, 30 years ago. So that's, I don't know if uh, don't don't be fooled with this dark head of hair here. I mean that's that's uh, that's a long long time ago, or, or it seems like a long time ago, but it's it's actually not. So uh, so we'll that'll be coming up pretty pretty quick. So uh, great. Well, thank you, Shelby, for that, and uh, Baran, uh, appreciate you joining us today for this conversation. Really insightful uh, conversation and insight. Thank you very much. All right. And so for this episode of NLV Live, that's going to do it for us. Again, our guest was Baran Yinya, who is the sales uh, manager at uh, Gusto MSC. And uh, I am Michael Gaines. Our production team was Kamal Carr and Weihan Lin. Uh, Shelby Dumain is our digital media specialist. And uh, we will continue to provide you insight and expertise here on the show. If you want to find out more, feel free to go to NOV.com forward slash live for previous episodes of this show and our other programs. For all of us here at NOV, thanks for watching and for listening. And we'll talk to you later.